tried to share my screen with you all. How is that? Can we see that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Cool. Okay, awesome. So yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much, Holly, um, and the FSC for inviting me along to, to do this talk. Um, it's really exciting to be able to do this to so many people. So um, yeah, I hope people find it interesting and get something useful from it. Um, so yeah, my name is Craig Dunton. I work for the Back Conservation Trust um, on uh, this Back from the Brink uh, project, which is a, a partnership program which arose from the State of Nature reports of 2013 and 2016, which showed um, that 56% of our studied species uh, in England are in decline and have been since the 1970s at the least. Um, it showed that England is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world, having lost more nature than the global average. Um, so the aim of Back from the Brink was to try to bring some of these species uh, back from the brink of potential extinction. So the aim was to halt or reduce the loss of bio biodiversity by the end of the programme um, and have uh, 100 priority spe species in a re recovering position um, by the end of the programme, which is uh, pretty much now some of the, the projects are coming to an end. So uh, a bit about the partnership. Um, the partnership programme between Natural England, uh, which lots of you will know is uh, England's uh, statutory nature conservation body. Um, so uh, the government body responsible for nature conservation and biodiversity and partnered with Rethink Nature, uh, which is made up of seven of the country's leading wildlife conservation charities. So it's a bit of a groundbreaking project. Um, nothing like this has ever been um, tried before. Um, as, as what's a wildlife conservation org organisations, we never worked um, this collaboratively at this level. Um, so it's been, you know, quite interesting um, and, you know, really quite um, very promising to be working on a, on a project like this. So a bit about our funders, we're primarily funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, um, as well as People's Postcode Lottery um, and a range of other um, donors. So many thanks if you buy a lottery ticket. And to give an idea of the extent of the programme, um, Back from the Brink is working from the tip of Cornwall all the way up to Northumberland National Park uh, with various projects um, running the length and breadth of the country. Um, so it's uh, seven integrated projects that are uh, primarily focused on threatened habitats and landscapes that will support a range of species. And then there are 12 uh, projects that are very much focused on species. Um, so that's two mammals, uh, two birds, two plants, and six invertebrates. So on to our bats. Um, I don't really know how much um, people in the audience know about bats, so I'm just going to go through a few sort of uh, key facts. Um, these are sort of mainly to do with um, our, our UK bat species. Um, so bats are the only truly flying mammals. Um, there are other mammals that fly in inverted commas, uh, things like lemurs and squirrels, but they're just sort of uh, falling gracefully with style. Um, bats are the only mammals that have truly powered flight. Um, in the UK, our, all of our bat species are mostly nocturnal. So uh, the, the vast majority of their activity is at night time, but they will come out during the day if they are very hungry or thirsty, um, particularly in early spring. Um, and often at this time of year as well, as they're sort of uh, going into their hibernation. Um, so uh, part of the reason they're nocturnal is to avoid predation. Um, going out at night time also reduces their competition with other uh, insect eating flying things like birds. Um, and it's also useful for thermoregulation. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, they, they hibernate in winter. So they enter a state of torpor. Uh, to save energy when their food resources, insects, uh, start to decrease in winter. And this can reduce their energy expenditure by between 50 and 90%. So it's a really useful strategy for um, saving energy. 
Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, all UK bat species are insectivorous. Uh, they don't drink blood. Um, they, there are various um, bats around the world that eat a range of other things, so fruit and uh, frogs and fish and all sorts. Uh, but in the UK, we're, they're purely insectivorous. Um, there's in excess of 1,400 bat species worldwide, so that makes up um, approximately 20% of the world's mammals. Um, and here in the UK, our mammal, our bats make up about a third of um, our native mammals. So they're a really important part of our um, natural history and of our ecosystems. So in the UK, we've got 17 breeding species. Um, and down here um, in Devon, where my project is based, we're very, very lucky to have 16 out of those 17 species. So a bit about their um, requirements. So bats need a, a fairly complex set of requirements to survive. So they need their uh, roosting sites. So where they, um, where they breed, where they hibernate, where they rest up, um, sometimes where they feed. Um, this can range from buildings, um, including barns and churches, um, to caves, mines and cellars. Um, so sort of caves pictured here and then trees as well. So these can be their summer maternity roosts. Um, this can be, you know, uh, for the grey long eared it's um, big open roof spaces, usually in quite large old buildings, um, but also barns and churches. Um, and then in winter, um, it's uh, often underground environments, so caves and mines. Um, but for the grey long eared no one really knows where they all go. Um, in the winter. Um, and then another really important thing that bats need in the landscape are their foraging sites, so where they go to feed on uh, all the insects that they like to eat. So uh, that can be um, wildflower meadows. Um, this is a particularly favourite foraging uh, habitat for the grey long-eared, uh, but also woodlands, um, wetlands, um, hedgerows, but basically anywhere where there's lots of insects. Um, and then another really important feature in the landscape that bats need is um, connectivity. So linear features within the landscape um, to enable um, bats to get from their roost sites to their foraging sites. So these are um, often linear features. They like to use their echolocation to follow li linear features through the landscape. So things like hedgerows, um, watercourses like rivers and streams, um, woodland edges. Um, this could be um, species rich areas on arable margins, um, but anything linear and preferably um, areas that have um, lots of insects, um, which is also good for foraging. So in terms of um, bat population trends, um, the data or the most recent data tends to suggest that most UK bat populations um, that we're able to monitor are stable or recovering. Um, a lot of this is due to current legislation and conservation efforts um, having an effect on populations. We have very serious historical um, uh, population declines and there's obviously still significant pressures um, on bats populations. Um, so the, the sort of current trends that, um, so, well, several bat species that we're able to monitor, the, the populations are increasing or stable. Um, suggests that we really need to continue um, and strengthen our current legislation and, and conservation work that we're doing for, for bat species. So one thing people often ask me is how bats are faring and it kind of all depends on the species. Um, as you can see from this um, bar chart here, uh, it really, yeah, the, some, some species are um, a lot more common um, than others. So we've got um, greater and lesser horseshoe um, on the far left um, with numbers um, sort of uh, yeah, around sort of tens of thousands. Um, and then you look at the highest ones, the pipistrels are most common bat species sort of in the sort of three to four million. Um, and also another uh, common species are the Dorbentons. Um, this one here. Um, I think that's around, uh, yeah, around a million. Um, and then we go on to our grey long-eared, um, 
which are current population population estimates are around a thousand. Um, so very much significantly lower than um, any of the other species, species that we're able to monitor. Um, you'll notice here that we haven't got all of the um, UK bat species listed here. Um, that's um, just because we just don't have the data um, to make um, useful um, population estimates. So onto the grey long-eared. Um, it's a medium-sized bat uh, with a wingspan of around 25 to 30 centimetres. Um, so our smallest bats are pipistrelles, wingspans are around 20 centimetres and our biggest bats, so greater horseshoes or nocturals, um, can be sort of somewhere between 35 to 40 centimetre long wingspan. Um, so as you can see, this uh, that has incredibly long ears. Um, they're almost as long as its body, so sort of four to five centimeter long ears. Um, and it's known as a whispering bat, um, which means that uh, they echolocate very, very quietly uh, because they've, they've co-evolved with a group of insects um, that have um, evolved to enable, um, well, they, they can essentially hear um, bats echolocation. Um, so the the long-eared bats have evolved to um, try to get around that by echolocating very quietly. Um, so these um, these insects they're, they're called uh, tympanate moths. Um, some of them um, they basically have a, a membrane in certain parts of their body which um, vibrates when they hear back bats echolocation or vibrates because of the sound waves of echolocation. Um, so it's incredibly quiet. Um, it's uh, one of the two long-eared bats that we have in this country. So um, the other one's the brown long-eared, which is, is much more common. Um, they're very, very similar to look at, uh, but grey long-eards are, funnily enough, uh, more grey. Um, although juvenile brown long-eards um, can look um, quite grey as well. Um, so one method of um, differentiating between the two, or a couple of um, methods are um, you're able to measure certain parts of the body. So the tragus, that um, feature within the ear there that you can see. So they have different tragus widths. Um, and also they have um, potentially quite different thumb measurements. Um, I caveat all of that with um, the fact there's loads of crossover between the two. Um, so they're really quite tricky to identify. So DNA is the only um, definite way to establish which one it is. Um, but we have just released um, a long-eared bat guide, uh, which is on the BCT website. And also there's a download available on the Back from the Brink website, which um, it doesn't give you sort of 100% definite ways of identifying between these two, but it gives you um, a lot of information that will kind of send you in the right direction and to give you a clear picture. Um, so have a look at that if you want to um, find out a bit more. Um, I will be talking a bit more about that later on, actually. Um, so this bat weighs about 12 grams, depending on the time of year and how much it's eaten, which is about the same as a two pound coin. Um, and its favourite foods are, are nocturid moths, so yellow underwings, and also tapulidae, which are crane flies, um, which are the adult form of, form of leather jackets, which can be quite a significant agricultural pest. So they're quite useful. In, um, in terms of pest suppression, um, or can be potentially in the agricultural landscape. So to give you an idea of uh, the grey long-eared's global distribution, so it's uh, obviously the orange um, found um, throughout most of, sort of central and southern Europe. Um, there is a record on Madeira, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, uh, down here. Um, that uh, we're not really sure whether it's um, a natural um, record or if it's been was introduced by by people. And also, there's a bit of a, an outlier up here in Sweden um, where there's a record. But essentially, the, the stronghold for the, the global population is in um, sort of Spain and Portugal in the, the warmer parts of Europe. Um, and then um, it's found. Um, the northerly most ed edge of its range uh, about 53 degrees north so it's sort of just dipping into um, the south coast of England. So it's 
essentially its range is essentially restricted by low winter temperatures um, and also availability of foraging habitat. So um, climate change models tend to suggest that our um, climate is going to be start getting warmer um, in the north, um, which suggests that our species are going to start shifting northwards. So the this northernmost edge of its range is potentially really important um, in terms of um, we need to make sure that there's enough foraging habitat um, in England um, for it to be able to move freely um, because there's um, evidence also that in the south in the, um, the southernmost part of its range in Spain and Portugal where there's the highest level of genetic diversity um, climate change predictions are suggesting that these areas are going to become much hotter and much harsher so individuals are going to find it much more of a struggle to survive there um, and also because of um, various barriers within the landscape so mountain ranges and various other features this could potentially stop their dispersal so the northernmost edge of its range is, is quite critical to ensuring its survival it's, it's going to get squeezed in the south and we need to make sure it's not going to get squeezed in the north um, in terms of um, lack of foraging habitat. So out of the English population, why, why are we focusing on the Devon population? I've put this um, phylogenetic tree of the European population up. Um, so as you can, you probably can't see it all in detail, but the sort of yellowy orange bit here is the um, the main body of the global population, so um, sort of Iberia, um, Portugal and Spain, um, the vast majority of the population is there, um, which means the vast majority of genetic diversity is there. Um, so the English population is just this little bit of blue underneath. Um, so each of these individual populations, so um, Devon, Dorset, a couple of populations in Dorset and the Isle of Wight, each of which, which have quite um, significantly unique uh, genetic traits. So the Devon population is um, the most Western um, and it's considered to be the most fragmented from the rest of the English population. So um, it's got very low um, effective population size um, and very low genetic diversity. And it is quite genetically different from the rest of England. So we really need to do um, everything we can to try to make sure that this population is um, made as, as stable as it can be, um, but also as well connected um, with within itself, but also with other populations within England. So making sure it's well connected to Dorset. So a bit about the, um, the project. Um, so from the map there, you can see um, these are the, the known maternity colonies within England. So as you can see, it's, it's kind of just dotted along the south coast really um, it's almost all of the maternity roosts are found within sort of five to ten kilometers of the coast which is quite interesting i'm not really sure why um, but my um my project is very much focused on the devon um, maternity colonies so i don't deal with um, dorset and the isle of Wight as a, for reasons that i've mentioned um, so the gray longed bat is one of england's rarest mammals um, the 2018 mammal review uh, suggested a population estimate of around a thousand, uh, as I've said, with um, intervals between four and three thousand. Um, it's very much restricted to the south, as I've said, so Devon, Dorset, Somerset, Hampshire, the Isle of Wight and Sussex. And we're, as, as the project goes on, we're picking up new records that are sort of creeping northwards. Um, so as you can see, we've got a little dot up there in North Devon um, or Somerset. Um, so we are sort of picking up um, the potential beginnings of uh, the species range shift that's predicted. Um, so yeah, current status, it's uh, near threatened on the IUCN red list. Uh, and the that 2018 mammal review um, tends to suggest that the population trend is still decreasing. Um, it's protected like all bats in the UK under the Wildlife Countryside Act and Habitats Directive, um, but it's not an Annex 2 species um, like some of our other um, rare bat species like uh, greater and lesser horseshoe, um, barbastell and beckstein. Sorry. 
so yeah, here's um, I thought I'd just put in this little um, snip from the uh, long eared bat guide that we've been developing. Uh, so the, the bat at the top um, is our grey long eared, and the one at the bottom is the brown. Um, so I won't go through all the um, all the features, but it just gives you an idea of um, you know it, it's kind of a range of things that will give you um, an indication um, as to the species. So um, if you if you you know, if you are if you are regularly working with um, long-eared bats uh, within the range or even on the edges of the range, then do have a look at this and um, you know have a have a um, you know, potential better understanding of um, which species you might be working with. Okay, so key threats. Um, obviously, a, a loss of roosts is a, a quite. A, potentially big factor. We, we are aware of some roosts that have been lost um, over the past few years. Um, this can be um, through renovation work. So um, the, you know, down here in Devon, it's, uh, the barn conversions are a classic, you know, these sort of big um, sort of Devon stone uh, buildings that, you know, the grey long-eared bats love. Um, so many of them have been turned into um, sort of residential dwellings. Um, lots of roosts could be through persecution. A lot of people don't like to have bats in their buildings, who knows why. Um, disturbance of winter roosts could, could be an issue. So, um, you know, caves and mines and cellars um, being disturbed. Um, and also potentially, as I mentioned, um, you know, potential misidentification of which long-eared species um, you might be working with. Um, so they do have quite um, different requirements. Um, so it's worth having a look at that guide. Um, so one of the key things that my project works with is habitat loss and fragmentation. So we know that, um, you know, these, these, these factors are a major driver in our biodiversity loss, not just bats, but all of our biodiversity, um, primarily as a result of agricultural intensification um, and our land management, um, but obviously also um, increased development and uh, urban expansion. Um, which you know can bring along with it light pollution, um, not only um, on commuting routes and foraging sites, but also potentially on roosts, um, and then also vehicle collisions um, are a factor for all all bat species. So here's um, a map of the project area where I'm working. Uh, so the green dots are almost all of the grey long-eared individual records that we've got in Devon. We do have a few others scattered about, but these are almost all of our records. Um, so the purple um, circles are our um, uh, sustenance zones. We work in a five kilometre sustenance zone around the core roosts, um, working with landowners and farmers um, within these zones, um, trying to improve um, things for um, well, land management for their foraging and, and connectivity. And also the black line um, is our least cost path. So this is um, deemed to be the most um, efficient way for grey long-eared bats to be um, moving between their populations within Devon. Um, so I'm also working with landowners along these uh, black lines um, where possible. So my project objectives um, are primarily landowner engagement. So encouraging that um, bat friendly land management. Um, so this can be sort of whole holding advice um, related to countryside stewardship, or um, we've been working with various landowners that have been um, engaged with sort of voluntary measures um, in terms of grassland restoration. So as I've mentioned before, uh, species rich grassland, so wildflower meadows, are the grey long-eared bats' favourite um, foraging area. So we're doing um, quite a lot of habitat creation and restoration, trying to encourage um, the expanse of their favourite foraging habitat. Um, a major part of the project is uh, population monitoring. So um, looking at all of the, the key roosts um, and trying to make sure that they're effectively monitored and trying to get all of that data into the National Bat Monitoring Programme. Um, uh, another major part of the work is community engagement, trying to raise awareness um, of this amazing bat that um, people have um, in their local area, um, and also engaging with volunteers 
um, trying to um, encourage more people to come out um, and help us with the population monitoring, um, but also learning how to do some of the data analysis and um, learning how to give uh, talks and do bat walks, things like that as well. So in terms of landowner engagement, um, since 2017, I've been working on the project and we've engaged with um, sort of in excess of 180 landowners within our project areas. So the red blobs are um, sort of uh, land holdings that we've um, spoken to about um, grey long eared bats and, and land management. So this can be, as I've mentioned, in, in terms of countryside stewardship, um, helping farmers navigate their way through the schemes. Um, which can be quite um, quite tricky and quite complex. Um, also hedgerow management advice for foraging and connectivity. So um, trying to improve that, that connectivity through the landscape as well as improving um, foraging opportunities. So appropriate hedgerow management ticks both of those boxes. Um, effective grazing management. So um, the way that um, grasslands are grazed is, is a really important um, factor in in terms of um, encouraging invertebrates and for biodiversity in general. Um, so yeah, this could be part of countryside stewardship agreement or um, that sort of voluntary measures in, in terms of grassland restoration, which I'll probably talk a bit more about later. So the, yeah, the landowner engagement side of things it can be um, in terms of workshops. So um, well, pre-COVID, pre it was sort of getting people together, um, groups of farmers and talking about um, land management and effective ways to um, deliver um, beneficial things for the grey long-eared. Um, individual site visits, so um, having sort of giving tailored advice uh, for land holdings, um, primarily for grass and restoration, but also um, arable and um, other habitats as well. Um, giving presentations to groups of farmers um, and community groups and uh, giving farm walks as well, um, trying to um, highlight to other, to, to landowners, you know, other people that are doing really good things in the landscape. So the habitat creation and restoration, with, if you look at the, the top um, couple of pictures, we're aiming to uh, convert grasslands in the sort of central of the slide there um, to something more like um, on the right, um, so more species diversity, more structural diversity, um, just ways to encourage more invertebrates um, uh, into the into the pasture, um, which will enable um, you know, much better foraging opportunities for grey long eards um, and other species. Um, we've converted or well created or restored um, about fifty hectares. Um, within the project area so far. Um, these are all, we, we call them meadows in transition because it's never really a, um, an end um, product. I don't see it as ever really ending. It's, you know, it's a continual um, process that will, you know, potentially can always get better and better um, as more and more species get established um, and the structure of it becomes, becomes better. Um, so you can see there within our um, project area, uh, the Grass and restoration sites we did in 2018 are the yellow dots and then red ones in 2019. And then we've got um, some more planned um, for later this year. So we, um, we oversow um, existing pasture, permanent pasture with a um, seed mix um, that generally um, needs to contain a yellow rattle, um, which is a, a plant species that's uh, um, hemiparasitic. So it holds back um, some of the dominant grasses um, as it parasitizes um, them and takes some of their nutrients and it encourages other species to, to come through and, and flourish. So we use um, this species um, as a bit of a, a conservation tool, but it's also, you know, it's also really good for pollinators and um, it's a you know, lovely native wildflower. So in terms of um, population monitoring and engagement, um, a big part of what we do is data collection. It was never really um, a target of the project to find new roosts, but this has inevitably happened. Um, these are sort of roosts of varying types, but usually very low numbers of bats, um, usually sort of ones or twos. 
and none of them have been drastically outside of the known range, apart from one or two outliers. Um, and we've had really good um, cooperation from consultants and back carers, um, the Record Centre, the Devon Biodiversity Record Centre, and of course Devon Back Group, um, fantastic organisation, um, really helping us um, deliver on our objectives for the project and helping us to build a better picture of what um, is going on with this population um, within the landscape in Devon. Um, in terms of roost and habitat monitoring, um, we we monitor the uh, the known maternity roosts that we know about, um, but we also um, have started monitoring some of the habitats that we're changing. So um, using uh, bat detectors, putting them out on um, site with some of the um, on some of the grass and restoration sites, um, with a view to long term trying to establish um, whether um, there's a sort of a, any long term changes in bat activity. Um, and we've engaged and trained um, over 80 volunteers um, to date and hope to do a few more before the, the project's finished. Um, I have to uh, mention our grey long-eared bat champions, and these are a, a couple of individuals that um, have sort of uh, volu voluntarily gone above and beyond um, the, uh, the sort of level of usual volunteer, and they're, you know, they're really, really passionate about bats and delivered amazing things in terms of bat walks and, and talks um, within their communities. Um, and in terms of other community events, um, you know, we've delivered over 50 um, events, so that's bat walks and farm walks, um, landowner workshops, talks to various community groups, um, bat detector training, um, and sound analysis training, and then articles in various um, publications. So future plans, um, we've got an extension to our funding. So we'll, we'll be finishing the project in July uh, next year. So um, we're hoping for continued landowner engagement, primarily um, within the sort of central um, project area. Um, more grass and restoration and monitoring. So we're gonna be doing some more seeding this autumn, um, working with um, several um, farmers and landowners uh, with uh, seeding to, to in encourage uh, more wildflower meadows within the landscape. Um, we'll also be monitoring um, some of our restoration sites with audio moths, the, uh, the little bat detector pictured there. Um, we'll be increasing some of our roost monitoring, so trying to get more, more sites into the National Bat Monitoring Programme. Um, engaging more with volunteers over the next um, few months. Um, we, we developed, uh, a couple of months ago, we developed a grey longed bat pack for schools. Um, so there's um, a sort of activity pack um, for um, encouraging more species, bits of species rich grass and within school grounds. Um, and then also the long-eared bat guide, which I've mentioned, which um, I think uh, Holly was going to put a link in the chat section um, for you to have a look at. Um, and I think, yeah, just my final slide um, with some information about the project and the partnership. And uh, yeah, very happy to take any questions. So that's uh, my presentation done. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Craig. We've got quite a few questions no in the okay, chat cool. already. So I'm gonna jump in, I think. Um, Stephen was asking earlier, you were talking about them being whispering bats. Oh, sorry, my chat box is going crazy now with questions. I'll just scroll down. Okay, no worries. Um, yeah, Stephen was asking about the yellow underwings. Can they hear all other bats? Uh, yes, they probably can. Yeah, so um, so the yellow underwings and there's a, a, gr a group of moths called the tympanate moths um, that have, uh, um, you know, var various bits on their body. Um, they have um, these sort of uh, little membranes or, or features on their bodies that vibrate with sound waves. Um, so they've kind of co-evolved to be able to hear um, bats in general, um, so they can um, essentially they'll they'll hear a bat echolocating. Um, you know, hear in inverted commas they can't act, they don't have ears so they, they can't hear, but they they're aware of um, the, the sound waves. So they they do a variety of different species will do a variety of different things. So some of them will take evasive maneuvers so um, to try and avoid the bat that's hunting them. Um, some of them will just stop flying and drop out of the sky. Um, so these, um, these bats, um, because they've, um, or the, so because they can hear, um, other bat species, um, 
they've kind of, um, the, the grey long-eared and the brown long-eared have evolved to echolocate much more quietly. Um, so um, they kind of, they're in a bit of an arms race really, um, as to as who's going to win, who knows. But, <laughs> but yeah, I hope that answers your question, Stephen. <laughs> Great, thank you. And then Sarah's asking, um, why is the grey long-eared bat not an Annex 2 species and what difference does that make when it comes to conservation? Um, okay, so um, it's generally um, not an Annex 2 because um, the data isn't there. Um, it's only fairly recently that we've actually got enough data to, um, to know what the population size is. Um, so there potentially should be other um, Annex 2 bat species um, out there, but we just don't have the data um, to, um, to say that this, you know, this species is that rare. Um, it's also because it, you know, the, um, that kind of level of, uh, the conservation measures, you know, it happens every, I don't know how, how often, but quite a long period of time will go between species being, um, put into these different categories. Um, so I think if it, if it was to happen today, then the grey long, it probably would, um, become an Annex 2 species. Um, and it just generally means it's got a higher, higher level of protection, um, than, other bats. Okay, thank you. And we've got a couple of similar questions as well as one from Sean and one from Izzy. Um, they were asking how were the least cost path for the bats calculated? Uh, okay, so this was um, quite a complex um, way of looking at um, habitats. So it was, it was mainly done with habitat mapping. Um, so looking at um, potential barriers within the landscape, um, it would have had a, a, um, uh, a cut, um, what am I trying to say, a height um, indicator, so grey long eared bats generally won't go above a certain um, height above sea level, um, but it would also be to do with the um, sort of priority habitats that um, grey long eared bats are most likely to be using, so species rich grassland, um, wet meadows, um, and also to do with hedgerow connectivity, hedgerow quality, um, so it's done with um, sort of habitat mapping uh, prior to the start of the project. Great, thank you. Um, and then got a couple of questions from Liz and Sarah that are along the same lines, uh, basically asking about the grassland restoration that you mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Are farmers receiving any funding or grants to encourage them to restore and maintain the wildflower meadows? And how will this be retained in the long term after the project's finished? Good question. Um, so, okay, there are there are kind of two main paths um, towards grassland restoration that farmers can go down, um, related to my project anyway. So, um, countryside stewardship is one that could, can potentially support um, grassland restoration. Um, so, the um, mid-tier and higher-tier um, countryside stewardship agreements um, that farmers can enter into, there there will be um, options within those sort of packages that uh, mean that you know farmers have to do certain things on their on their land um, that will um, you know encourage species and structural diversity within within the grassland um, the other sort of main way is that you know primarily what we're doing is encouraging um, farmers and landowners to um, sort of do things voluntarily um, so we're as, as the project we're supplying wildflower seed um, to people um, they're they're doing all the preparation getting all the grazing right and making sure that um, you know the, the there's a long-term plan for um, managing things in the right way um, and I think we, we found through this project there's you know it kind of encourages a lot more um, passion and a lot more commitment when you know with these voluntary measures um, are sort of made available to people, you know, because wildflower seed is quite prohibitively expensive if you're going to restore grass and um, yourself, you know, people are really, you know, there's a lot of people that are really interested in doing it, but I'm willing to sort of give the initial outlay, um, but are happy to continue with the long term management. Um, and I think, you know, this is potentially um, likely to be more beneficial long term than some of the stewardship schemes, which are, you know, they have a finite um, time, you know, five year or 10 year period. Um, 
which after that you can you know potentially do um, whatever you want um, but the new um, environmental land management schemes are sort of being worked on at the moment um, and long term you know I think there's going to be a big focus on some of those priority habitats um, that have become all but lost from our landscape so those sort of species rich grasslands and wetlands and um, woodlands are going to be a, a big focus so I think longer term um, uh, I don't want to get too much into the political side of things but if you know if the current government um, you know uh, try to stick to their 25 year environment plan then potentially there could be some really positive things you know down the line in terms of the sort of landscape scale conservation. Great thank you. Um, Stephen was asking how easy is it to pick up long-eared bats on bat detectors and can you distinguish between the grey and the brown long-eared bats with them? Uh, yeah it's really difficult. <laughs> Um, okay, so because they're um, because they're a whispering bat, they echolocate very quietly. Um, it's you know it, it can be very um, tricky to pick them up. You generally need to be within sort of five meters um, of the bat echolocating to be able to pick them up on most bat detectors. Um, another issue is that um, long-eared bats they come out um, well one one big factor is they don't always echolocate when they're in very familiar surroundings um, because um, bats do actually have quite good vision. Um, they might not always bother to be echolocating. Um, so even if, you know, even if the bat's there um, and you've got your bat detector and you're within five meters, um, it might not even be echolocating. So they are, they are pretty tricky to, to pick up. Um, and whether you can distinguish between um, brown and greys is kind of, um, similar to the, the sort of visual recognition of them, um, there are differences in their echolocation, um, but there's quite a lot of crossover. So it's kind of um, not necessarily a definitive um, sort of 100% uh, way, you know, um, but there's, we've kind of um, gone with the view that if you are uh, sort of linking in with sort of habitat preference as well. So if you're in the middle of a wildflower meadow, and you pick up a, a long-eared bat, then and, you, and you're within the range of grey long-eared bats, then chances are it's probably more likely to be a grey long-eared than a brown long-eared because brown long-eared is more likely to be foraging in, within woodland. Um, so it's kind of a, a few factors. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. It's not. Um, it's like everything around the grey long-eared. None of it's really a hundred percent. And I think in you know, I don't know, twenty years we'll probably know a lot more about this species and have sort of much more definitive ways of um, IDing it and in with various ways but um, but have a look at the, the long-eared bat guide because there's some information in there about um, echolocation and being able to recognize between the calls. Great thank you. Uh, Stephen Davidson was asking how would you find out if there's grey long-eared bats in his area? Can you look at distribution maps or anything to find out? Uh, yeah, on the the, um, the NBN gateway um, should show. Um, I think it has all the records that we have, or should do soon. Um, but yeah, the, the range will be pretty well indicated there. There's a few weird outliers um, on that map, um, but the NBN gateway is a good place to start. Um, and probably also, um, depending on where it is in the country, talk to your local bat group um, or bat carers because they, you know, quite often. Um, a lot of the new records that we've been having are from bat carers um, who have taken a, a bat into care and thought, oh, that looks a bit different and realised it's a grey long-eared. So, um, but yeah, I think, yeah, ha have a chat with your local bat group. That's probably a good place to start or, or drop me an email and then I'll, I can um, point you in the right direction as well. Thank you. Um, and then Colin is asking, is there a specific moth that the grey long-eared bat feeds on? Uh, yes, there, I mean there is, it's the yellow underwing um, but it's not necessarily because um, there's some kind of special ecological niche, it's just that this moth is incredibly common so um, it's, um, it doesn't really have any particularly particular habitat preference, it can be found in grasslands or woodland or scrub or you know it's it's quite a prolific moth. So it's kind of the favourite um, 
food of quite a few bat species. Um, but it's, you know, it, it kind of, uh, um, it's got a close relationship with the long eared because of, um, because of the echolocation thing, you know, the fact that they kind of co evolve together. Um, so it's not, um, you know, I think bats generally um, aren't that fussy in terms of what flying insects they'll eat, as, you know, as long as they're about the right size, <laughs> they'll, you know, they'll, they'll try and eat them. <laughs> so, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Sorry, I'll just look down. Uh, so Anne Marie was asking, how big is the foraging range of these bats and does that differ between other species? Is it? Uh, so yeah, um, so most of the data, so before the, um, as a kind of precursor to the project, there was various sort of radio tracking studies done um, from some of the known maternity colonies about how far um, this bat would go out foraging. Um, and it kind of depends, there's, there's a few factors really, it kind of depends, one of the key factor is um, proximity of foraging habitats. So if there's loads of species rich grassland within 500 metres of this bat's roost, chances are they're not going to bother going much further. Um, but because they, that their favoured foraging habitat is so fragmented, it kind of varied how far bats would go, um, also varied at sort of different times of the year. Um, whether it's sort of breeding period or, or not. Um, but the, the studies show that most bats sort of went, um, sort of the most common distance was about two kilometres um, from the maternity roost, but up to between five and six. Um, so it's decided a five kilometre sustenance zone around the, the roost was, you know, a good, um, a good area um, that would help benefit the bat. Um, compared with other species, um, it does vary quite a bit. Um, I think, you know, potentially a lot to do with availability of foraging habitat um, and connectivity. Um, so I think, you know, bats are all about saving energy. So if, you know, if all the food is right on their doorstep, they're not going to bother going much further. But I think because, because all those really good foraging habitats, so species rich grassland and wetland and, you know, good quality woodland with lots of invertebrates is all becoming less and more fragmented. You know, bats are being forced to go further than they probably would naturally. Um, but uh, thinking about the, the greater horseshoe, um, that sustenance zone is four kilometers. Um, so it does, you know, it does vary um, from bat to bat, but you know, I think it's, it's not necessarily um, all about, you know, their um, ecological needs. It's about what's happen, happening in the landscape, which might determine um, how far they go. Okay, thank you. And we had a couple of people asking as well, uh, what do you mean when you say maternity roost and how does that differ from a standard roost? Oh, okay, um, so generally um, most bat species will um, have a, a particular um, place where um, they will go to, to um, raise their young, um, so have, have their young and raise their young. So um, these are quite often uh, for, for a grey long-eared um, it's they're very loyal um, to their roosts so um, they like to go back to the same place year after year and these um, roosts will get passed down through families so um, sort of family members will, will go there um, to, to raise their young so it's you know they can have quite um, sort of long-term historical roosts um, that they'll just keep on going back to um, so there's there's kind of there, there's a sort of a range of different types of bat roost. Um, so maternity roost will be where um, they, they might have and raise their young. Um, hibernation roost will be where they, they go in winter um, to go into their torpor. Um, uh, night feeding roost might be when a, a bat goes out um, into the landscape foraging, um, plucking a moth out of the sky and then going and hanging up in a tree or up in a barn somewhere um, to eat. Um, relax for a while. Um, they quite often have um, sort of transitory roosts as well so they might go between um, sort of the main summer period when they're most active and the winter period when they're not so active they'll have sort of transitory roosts where they uh, you know might travel from um, you know where they spend the summer and where they spend the winter might in a completely different you know, part of the country not I maybe mean, not the country but part of the county or you know, it can be quite far away um, so they have various places where they'll rest and 
um, recoup on the way. Um, so there's, you know, there's there's quite a range of different um, places where a bat might um, stop and rest and, and do whatever, um, but all of these are protected um, by law, so all roosts are protected. Um, I think that answers the question. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Liz was asking, uh, you're talking about you made these packs for schools. Are they available uh, outside of Devon? I think she's based in Dorset, so she's wondering if she can get hold of some. Uh, yeah, um, you can probably put my email on there, or I can put it on here, actually, and she, she can send me an email, and I can send her the pack. Great stuff. There you go, Liz. Um, right, I've got lots of questions left and I realise we're running out of time, so I'm going to scroll through and pick some random ones. Um, okay. Um, got Sorry, I think I, I think I just sent that to Anne-Marie privately, my um, email. Hang on. I can send that around afterwards as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, Lawrence is asking, do you know what sort of habitats the grey long-eared bat favours elsewhere in its range? And does it hunt other uh, tympanic moths elsewhere? Uh, yeah, I think it's generally um, quite similar um, habitats. I think in various other uh, parts of Europe where, you know, main, mainly, I'm sort of mainly thinking of its stronghold um, in sort of Spain and Portugal, they have similar habitats and a lot of um, the areas where they um, where they are it's um, the land management is less intensive so they have a lot more sort of um, you know species rich scrubby areas um, that might be more you know more close to natural or semi-natural habitats um, whereas here we've you know in, in England we've got quite heavily managed um, landscapes um, in terms of what else they eat I'm not sure I imagine they probably eat um, similar things, but um, you know there'll, there'll be you know, tympanic moss um, abroad that they'll have co-evolved with as well. Um, but yeah, I'm not not 100 sure on there. Yeah, that's fine. Don't worry. It's, probably, it's probably available somewhere. Um, I can have a look if you like. But. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and then we've got a question from TK who's asking. Have the landowners you've been working with been quite eager to engage with the project or have you come up against any sort of resistance or disinterest? Um, I think it's probably been more positive than negative. Um, I think because of the nature of the project, a lot of the time, you know, we've been, um, you know, making people aware of the project and then, you know, if they get back to us, then they're generally interested. If they don't get back to us, they're not <laughs> so I think there's been you know there's been times when I've been you know extremely busy you know trying to get around everyone who is interested in getting some advice or some seed or um so I think you know it varies a lot but I think there's there's a lot of um a lot of interest and passion in the landowning community to do the right thing in the landscape and I think there's you know there's been um you know this historical uh, sort of us and them between the sort of conservation um, bodies and sort of agricultural community and I think that those sort of lines are kind of blurring a lot at the moment and I think you know there's a lot of there's a lot of goodwill um, because you know the reason a lot of farming is very intensive is uh, you know our food prices and our government policies so it's um you know that there's, there's changes afoot and I think a lot of People are passionate about you know, adapting to those changes. Brilliant, thank you. Right, well, we've reached the end of the talk now. So thank you, Craig, for taking the time to talk to us today. No thank worries you at all. Everyone for joining us as well. And hopefully we'll see you all soon. So bye everyone. And you can unmute your microphones now. So I'm not talking to a blank screen. There we go. I can see some people. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.